Tokyo Live, and Tokyo Live, and also P1. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So uh, today we will discuss about the uh, uh, G poem. So uh, we have a very uh, nice uh, presenter today. So I'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Kevin Grimms. So uh, he is a professor of the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine uh, in Ohio. So, uh, <clears throat> So he uh, published uh, uh, some RCT papers, uh, the important RCT papers of the poem procedure. And uh, today he will talk about the one of the offshoot of the poem, so gastric poem for gastroparesis. So Kevin, please. Yes, thank you very, very much, Professor Inoue. Let me share my screen, this one. It's okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. So thank you once again for the opportunity to speak this morning or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I'll be speaking about uh, an update on the, the data for G poem, which as the professor mentioned is an offshoot of uh, esophageal poem. Um, this is where I'm currently located. Cincinnati is in the state of Ohio on the border with Kentucky. Uh, this is a picture of our downtown uh, with a bridge going across the Ohio River. So this picture is taken from Kentucky looking onto Ohio. Uh, I have no disclosures related to this talk. Uh, the objectives will be to discuss, of course, G-POEM, um, talking a little bit about background, then a little bit about technique. Um, we won't spend too much time because we do have a, a live session to follow this, uh, but mostly focusing on the safety of the procedure and the short and long-term outcomes. So a little bit about the background. Um, so in speaking about gastroparesis, uh, what we generally mean is objectively delayed gastric emptying in the absence of mechanical obstruction. Um, this is a study out of Minnesota, which is in the US, looking across about 10 years in one specific county uh, at all of, the, all of the people who live in that county, looking at how many people have diabetes, who develops gastroparesis, things like this. Uh, and in looking at unselected diabetic patients, so people who may or may not have symptoms, anywhere from 28 to 65% of those patients have diabetes, or I'm sorry, have gastroparesis. Uh, they did find that gastroparesis is much more common in women. And then there's a list of uh, etiologies for gastroparesis with uh, diabetes and idiopathic being the largest percentage. Uh, but other causes such as medications, connective tissue disease, post-surgical, uh, and malignancy are on here as well. Uh, if you're looking closely, you'll see that these numbers add up to more than 100%. There is some overlap in these categories. Patients were allowed to fall into more than one category. Um, and it's important to note that for post-viral gastroparesis, these are generally listed as idiopathic. Uh, in most of the studies that we're going to be talking about, uh, generally speaking, people only divide these into diabetes, idiopathic, and post-surgical. Uh, regarding symptom scores, a lot of the outcomes are based on this gastroparesis cardinal symptom index. This is similar to the Eckert score that we use for achalasia. Uh, this consists of three subscales uh, measured from zero to five, where zero is none and five is very severe for each of these, including things like nausea, vomiting, uh, bloating, inability to finish a meal. Uh, and uh, in defining clinical success based on this symptom score, generally uh, people will use a decrease of at least one, per, one point in the total score, uh, as well as a 25% decrease in at least two of the three subscales. Um, so uh, looking for out of the three different sets of symptoms, at least 25% decrease in two of those sets. A little bit regarding the technique. Uh, this can be done in the, the greater curve. This is the one that's most similar to the esophageal poem. Uh, this is done with a similar technique with a submucosal injection followed by an incision, creating a tunnel up to the pylorus uh, and then performing the myotomy under direct vision. Uh, this is, uh, these are some endoscopic pictures of that. Uh, 
Um, this again, this approach is the most similar to palm. Uh, for greater curve approach, generally this is going to be about a five centimeter tunnel. Uh, the long, the uh, incision is longitudinal, which is a little bit more difficult to close on the stomach than it is in the esophagus. Uh, but you can see it, the anatomy is, is much more clear where the target is as compared to esophageal palm. Uh, looking at picture C with the red arrow, uh, you can see the pyloric ring is this very tight white muscle. Uh, in D, E, and F, they're cutting that down to the uh, transverse bands. And then in G, they're trying to show that they're leaving some longitudinal fibers intact to avoid perforation. Uh, this is a slightly modified version of that, still on the greater curve. Uh, but this technique is done with the IT knife in which the pylorus, once it's identified uh, in picture E in the, in the dead center, uh, the knife is placed in the anal side of the pylorus and the pylorus is cut from anal to oral sides. Uh, the benefit of this, uh, the way it's described is that you can keep making multiple passes, uh, grabbing muscle until the knife doesn't catch any more muscle and then the myotomy is complete. Uh, the uh, G palm could also be performed on the lesser curve side. Uh, in the literature, this is much less common. Um, this uh, involves a transverse incision rather than longitudinal, which does allow for a shorter tunnel, uh, and it is much easier to close. Uh, other benefits are that the stomach does not have to be empty as long as you're in the left lateral decubitus position. Um, any food or liquid that's still left in the stomach would fall to the greater curve, leaving the lesser curve side clean to do the myotomy. Uh, the drawbacks are that this does differ from esophageal palm. Uh, so there is a bit of a learning curve compared to uh, doing the greater curve approach. Uh, the other issue is that this goes into a semi-retroflex view. So the angles are somewhat challenging. Uh, and based on that angle, uh, right at the pylorus, the duodenal mucosa does become perpendicular. So you have to be very careful. It probably is at slightly higher risk of injury on a lesser curve approach compared to a greater curve approach. So regarding safety, um, adverse events are reported anywhere between four and 13% of cases, depending on the study. Uh, these are generally quite minor. Um, this is one example in a meta-analysis of 11 studies where they reported adverse events of about 11%, the most common being bleeding, abdominal pain, and capnoperitoneum. Um, all three of those are quite easy to control. Um, the uh, uh, more uh, concerning adverse events such as perforation and, and, and pyloric stenosis occur at much lower rates. Uh, comparing this to surgical alternatives, um, on the left is a surgical pyloroplasty. Of course, this is mostly done laparoscopic. Similar rate of adverse events with the most common being a suture line leak. Uh, on the right column is a surgical pyloromyotomy uh, which is the similar to the procedure that's performed for children with pyloric stenosis, uh, where surgically only the pylorus muscle is cut, uh, but not full thickness uh, uh, through the mucosa. Uh, this has actually quite a high rate of adverse events in the adults, about 33%, mainly related to bleeding, infection, and ulceration of that area. Uh, and then the third surgical option, the gastric electrical stimulator, uh, I think mainly this is, is done in the US, uh, maybe a little bit in Europe. Um, adverse events here are about 26%, uh, mostly. Uh, so half of that is related to device dysfunction, either having leads that fail uh, or having to explant the, uh, the device that controls the stimulation. Uh, bleeding and infection also are, are relatively high risk here. And just for comparison, this was a propensity match study uh, between gastric electrical stimulator and g -palm. And in this particular study with matched patients, the adverse events for the g -palm were only 4%. Uh, so uh, overall for adverse events, for g -palm, most complications are quite minor. Uh, g -palm is at least as safe as a surgical pyloroplasty, and it's probably safer than pyloromyotomy or gastric stimulator placement. Uh, so regarding outcomes, uh, in the short term, there's quite a bit of data that's been published in the last year or two, uh, a large number of multi-center trials and meta-analyses. Um, these all use either the symptom score or uh, the four-hour solid gastric emptying test, or both of those in some combined fashion to determine the success rate. Uh, 
Um, surprisingly, even though these are all published very recently, uh, most of these meta-analyses did manage to find different studies, and so there's not much overlap uh, in these uh, in this chart. Uh, the success rate um, is reported anywhere from three to 12 months, ranges from 56 to 85 percent success. Uh, there seems to be about similar range for measuring this by symptom score or by the objective gastric emptying test. Uh, and interestingly, in two studies, they did report normalization of gastric emptying study in about half of patients. Um, so this is looking closer at, at one of those studies from the chart. Um, this is a meta-analysis of 10 studies. Three of those were prospective. The interesting thing here is that they did separate these into prospective and retrospective subgroups, uh, and they found uh, quite a substantial difference in the reported success rate with prospective studies reporting about a 50% success retrospective studies about a 70% success. Um, so this is what we would expect. This is what we see in, in other areas where uh, retrospective studies tend to overestimate the success rate. Um, this is a study that uh, also came from the chart that compared both the four-hour gastric emptying study and the symptom score in, the, in mostly the same patients. Uh, and this showed about a 10% difference when success is measured by um, the gastric emptying study as compared to the symptom score, uh, which means that objectively patients are doing better than they think they are, um, which can be a problem for managing them postoperatively. Uh, this is a, yet another meta-analysis out of Spain that's not included in the chart because they didn't report a specific percentage of success. Uh, but I included this for two reasons. <clears throat> One is to show the forest plots, um, to show that there is uh, there does appear to be success um, for GPOM based on both the symptom score and the gastric emptying study. And then also because they were one of the few meta-analyses that looked closely at uh, the bias of the papers that they included. Uh, and as you can see on here, um, just looking at green versus red, there's, there's quite a bit of red on here for selection bias, detection bias, reporting bias. Um, and this is what we would expect with uh, a large number of retrospective studies. So most of the meta-analyses in the, in the chart that I showed previously would have a similar breakdown of, uh, of bias of the included studies. So based on that, um, this is the, the final meta-analysis that I'll show. Um, this is a meta-analysis of 10 studies. Four of those are prospective, so that's the largest number that we have available right now. Um, they were very careful to examine all of the studies uh, to identify and exclude an outlier. Uh, and this is the forest plot of symptom score with that outlier excluded. And the clinical success when you do that is about 71%. And so this is probably the best estimate of success we have at the moment. Uh, regarding long-term outcomes, um, there is only a handful of papers uh, that have more than uh, 12 months of follow-up. This is a paper with three years of follow-up out of France, multi-center. Uh, they had um, about 77% uh, uh, of their patients that they were able to track to 36 months. Uh, roughly equal breakdown between diabetic, idiopathic, and post-surgical. They reported a 65% success rate. Uh, and interestingly, the predictor of success was satiety and bloating symptoms uh, being predominant preoperatively on the uh, symptom index. Uh, this is in comparison to a four-year follow-up out of Mexico. Uh, higher numbers, but much worse follow-up. They were only able to track about a quarter of their patients. The interesting thing here is that they had a larger number of diabetic patients. Uh, and that with that, they found that actually nausea and vomiting predominant symptoms were predictive of success. Um, so uh, putting this all together, uh, sorry, so for comparison then to uh, surgical options, um, this study is a meta-analysis, uh, 18 total studies, 11 of those were g poems, seven were pyloroplasty. You can see similar success rates by both four-hour gastric emptying study and by the cardinal symptom index. And again, we see about a 10% difference whether you measure this objectively or by symptom score. Um, this one is compared to pyloromyotomy, um, small study out of North America, the United States, Costa Rica, and Mexico. 
uh, and you can see a slight edge for uh, GPOLM uh, as far as success rate. And uh, if you recall just a, a bit ago when we talked about safety, the pyloromyotomy is the one that had about a 33% complication rate. Uh, and then the final comparison is uh, comparing GPOLM to the gastric electrical stimulator. Um, this is retrospective, but propensity matched. About half were idiopathic and half were non-idiopathic. Um, you can see uh, at 36 months, uh, slightly better than 60% uh, response for GPOLM, and that GPOLM is better than stimulator at all time points. Uh, if you break this down into idiopathic or uh, unfortunately, they combined diabetic and post-surgical into a single group here. Um, in the long term, no difference for diabetic and post-surgical, uh, but GPOLM is much better for idiopathic patients. So overall, putting this together, um, I would say that based on the data we have currently, GPOLM is safer and more effective than surgical pyloromyotomy and gastric electrical stimulator. It's probably equally safe and effective as to surgical pyloromyotomy, uh, but much easier to recover from. And then the data are still mixed about which patients are most likely to benefit. Um, a lot of the studies mix the etiology together. It may be helpful to separate this out into diabetic, idiopathic, and post-surgical in some future studies. And then regarding the symptoms, uh, there's conflicting data about whether nausea, vomiting predominant or bloating and satiety predominant is uh, more likely to respond. And based on the studies out of France and Mexico, possibly diabetic patients might respond better if they have nausea and vomiting, and idiopathic patients might respond better if they have bloating and satiety. Um, but of course, more studies are always going to be helpful in this regard. Um, so that's the, the conclusion of my talk. Uh -huh. And, uh, answer questions and uh, start some discussion. So I'll, I'll stop my sharing so that I can see you guys back on the screen. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Kevin. So uh, excellent talk. So we really appreciate it. And the, uh, you, you are actually covering so uh, all almost all aspect of the uh, uh, G poem. So it's a uh, very uh, helpful to us. And uh, today uh, we uh, also invite uh, the uh, uh, Dr. Stefan Zivald as a, a commentator. So he also has the uh, many experience of the GPOM. So uh, we like to uh, discuss uh, uh, about the GPOM. So uh, yes. Stefan, do you have, uh, yeah. Yes, Kevin, thank you very much for this outstanding presentation. It was an excellent overview. I think uh, one key message is that uh, we need more prospective data, also comparative studies, because I think it's very difficult to compare the endoscopic approach with uh, data also retrospectively from the surgical approach. But I think one key message was that there is a success rate about 60%. Um, but um, what do you think? How can we identify the best candidates for this uh, GPOEM intervention? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's difficult. It's still, it's still an evolution. Um, one of the main difficulties with gastroparesis is that there's a, a wide variety of etiologies. Um, you know, for achalasia, it's very easy for us. We have type 1, 2, 3. Um, for GPOM, there's, there's a list of 10 or 15 things. I'm sorry, for a gastroparesis, a list of 10 or 15 things that can be causing the, the gastroparesis. And I think potentially each one of those causes may respond slightly differently uh, to interventions. Um, there, you know, there are some suggestion that the type of symptom may uh, predict success. Um, there are studies that would say that if you approach the patients with an intervention earlier than 24 months from diagnosis, they're more likely to respond. So longer, uh, longer duration of disease, may be less likely to, uh, to respond to treatment. Um, and then there are some studies that suggest that um, doing a solid gastric emptying test and having at least 20% retention is more likely to respond to treatment. And I have another question with regards to the, to the diagnostics before the intervention. How do we define delayed emptying? Which uh, diagnostic procedure is the best? Which diagnostic procedure is available everywhere? What do you would you say about this? Yeah, it's uh, that's also a difficult question. Um, in the in the U.S., we use mainly solid gastric emptying, um, mm -hmm. which unfortunately um, doesn't always match with the symptoms. Uh, 
um, symptom score and emptying study um, often, you know, maybe in 25 or 40 percent of patients often do not correlate um, where some patients may have 50 percent retention and feel OK. And some patients may have all of the symptoms from the symptom score and have only five or 10 percent retention, which would be a normal emptying test. And so um, actually this is evolving even into uh, a diagnosis of what's called gastroparesis syndrome where all the mm. symptoms of gastroparesis are there, but there's no objective finding of delayed emptying. Um, and there is um, some very early evidence that maybe these patients would also respond to surgical intervention, but it's difficult because uh, it could be just a placebo effect. Do you have any information about the value of a smart pill and uh, scintigraphy? Um, what do you think about these procedures? Yeah, I think, I think smart pill is a good idea. Um, in the US, we don't have a lot of experience with this because it's very difficult to get this approved by our insurance companies. Um, so it, it's very easy to get a gastric emptying study. It's very, very difficult to get a smart pill, um, but uh, potentially that is one option. Um, in order to, to measure not just the gastric motility, but also small bowel and, and colon motility as well. Um, it's certainly possible that a lot of these patients have a, a global GI dysmotility and, and that, that working on the stomach may not be the whole story. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so uh, yeah, may I ask you? So uh, oh, Kevin, yeah. so uh, as you mentioned, the uh, so, um, gastroparesis is uh, more complicated uh, disease uh, than uh, caresia. So um, as a practical solution to decide the uh, indication of the uh, G-POM, so I myself uh, doing like this way. So uh, please uh, give me a comment. So you have the uh, lots of experience. So my, my uh, uh, strategy is the, uh, uh, before, prior to the uh, G-POM, so we do the uh, balloon dilation so using a 20 millimeter uh, regular uh, through the scope balloon, uh, the, the dilation of the peering. And then, so if the patient, uh, the <clears throat> one week later asks the patient, mm. so uh, most of the patients said, so after balloon dilation, one or two days was good. So mm -hmm. at the time, so uh, we decide, so to do the g -pom. So. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, uh, my, my practical solution is it the right or not? Not. I think. Not, not right? I think so. I think that's a. I think that's a good idea. That's similar to, um, you know, some centers are doing Botox injection into into pylorus for a similar purpose for for diagnosis to see um, does relaxing the pylorus uh, cause an improvement in symptoms or not. Um, I think there is one very small single arm retrospective study that, that says that uh, if the patients respond to Botox, they're likely to respond to G-POM. Um, and I think, I think your balloon dilation is a, a similar practical test for that. Yeah, um, another option may be as more and more centers are getting the endo flip, um, there may be some correlation between distensibility of the pylorus and whether or not they would respond to a G-POM. Okay, thank you. So Stefan, so please uh, continue your, <laughs> sorry, and interrupt your question. No, 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 no. Um, um, Kevin, did you hear anything about this double myotomy in G poem? I think there was a, uh, there were some endoscopists uh, suggesting this uh, double myotomy. Uh, maybe you can explain uh, or spend some words about this. Um, I, I didn't look so closely at this. I think maybe I saw something about that at DDW or somewhere where they're, correct me if I'm wrong, where they make a myotomy greater and lesser curve to, instead of exactly. making it yeah. like a teardrop, it, it, it splits it both open. Um, I, I think potentially that could improve the, the clinical outcomes. Um, we, we do find that with a single um, location cutting the pylorus that it, it does tend to scar back down and, and re-stenose in, in a, a fair number of patients just in my personal practice, we've done maybe 65 of these so far. And in the ones who they do okay for six months or a year, and then they start to have symptoms again. And if you redo the endoscopy, the pylorus looks tight again. Um, so the there may be some component where the, 
the stomach is able to better heal than the esophagus does with our, with our regular poems. Um, so potentially cutting that in two places would make that more difficult for it to, to re-stenose. And so, um, yes, please, Haro, please. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we have uh, thousands of uh, discussions, <laughs> but uh, uh, still uh, we need to uh, accumulate the data. And yes. then uh, uh, thank you very much. So uh, Kevin, uh, it's a good question. Uh, that, so uh, you a great talk. And the, uh, also thank you so much, uh, Stefan, uh, you are a uh, uh, nice uh, discussion. So uh, uh, because of the uh, time constraints, so uh, we will close this session. So thank you very much again. Thank you.